أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يريد الله ليبين لكم ويهديكم سنن الذين من قبلكم ويتوب عليكم والله عليم حكيم والله يريد أن يتوب عليكم ويريد الذين يتبعون الشهوات أن تميلوا ميلا عظيما يريد الله أن يخفف عنكم وخلق الإنسان ضعيفا يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تأكلوا أموالكم بينكم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تأكلوا أموالكم بينكم بالباطل إلا أن تكون تجارة عن تراض منكم ولا تقتلوا أنفسكم إن الله كان بكم رحيما ومن يفعل ذلك عدوانا وظلما فسوف نصليه نارا وكان ذلك على الله يسيرا إن تجتنبوا كبائر ما تنهون عنه نكفر عنكم سيئاتكم وندخلكم مدخلا كريما ولا تتمنوا ما فضل الله به بعضكم على بعض للرجال نصيب مما اكتسبوا وللنساء نصيب مما اكتسبوا واسألوا الله من فضله إن الله كان بكل شيء عليما ولكل جعلنا موالي مما ترك الوالدان والأقربون والذين عقدت أيمانكم فآتوهم نصيبهم إن الله كان على كل شيء شهيدا الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض وبما أنفقوا من أموالهم فالصالحات قانتات حافظات للغيب بما حفظ الله واللاتي تخافون نشوزهن فعظوهن واهجروهن واهجروهن في المضاجع واضربوهن فإن طعنكم فلا تبغوا عليهن سبيلا إن الله كان عليا كبيرا وإن خفتم شقاق بينهما فبعثوا حكما من أهله فبعثوا حكما من أهله وحكما من أهلها إن يريد إصلاحا يوفق الله بينهما إن الله كان عليما خبيرا واعبدوا الله ولا تشركوا به شيئا وبالوالدين إحسانا وبذي القربى واليتامى والمساكين والجار ذي القربى والجار الجنب والجار الجنب والصاحب بالجنب وابن السبيل وما ملكت أيمانكم إن الله لا يحب من كان مختالا فخورا الذين يبخلون ويأمرون الناس بالبخل ويكتمون ما آتاهم الله من فضله وأعتدنا للكافرين عذابا مهينا والذين ينفقون أموالهم رئاء الناس ولا يؤمنون ولا يؤمنون بالله ولا باليوم الآخر ومن يكن الشيطان له قرينا فساء قرينا وماذا عليهم لو آمنوا بالله واليوم الآخر وأنفقوا مما رزقهم الله وكان الله بهم عليما إن الله لا يظلم مثقال ذرة وإن تك حسنة يضاعفها ويؤتم اللدن 
ve yu'timil ladunhu ajran azima fe keyfe iza ci'na min kulli ummatin bi shahid ve ci'na bika ala ulai shahida yawma idhin yawaddu alladhina kafaru wa asaw ar-rasul law tusawwa bihim al-ard ve la yaktumun Allaha haditha ya ayyuhalladhina amanu la taqrabu as-salata wa antum sukara wa antum sukara hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun wa la junuban illa 'abiri illa 'abiri sabilin hatta taghtasilu wa in kuntum marda aw 'ala safar أو على سفر أو جاء أحد منكم من الغائط أو لامستم النساء فلم تجدوا ماء فتيمموا صعيدا فتيمموا صعيدا طيبا فامسحوا بوجوهكم وأيديكم إن الله كان عفوا غفورا ألم تر إلى الذين أوتوا نصيبا من الكتاب يشترون الضلال ويريدون أن تضلوا السبيل والله أعلم بأعدائكم وكفى بالله وليا وكفى بالله نصيرا من الذين هادوا يحرفون الكلمة عن مواضعه ويقولون سمعنا وعصينا واسمع غير مسمع وراعنا وراعنا ليا بألسنتهم وطعنا في الدين ولو أنهم قالوا سمعنا وأطعنا واسمع وانظرنا واسمع وانظرنا لكان خيرا لهم وأقوم ولكن لعنهم الله بكفرهم فلا يؤمنون إلا قليلا يا أيها الذين أوتوا الكتاب آمنوا بما نزلنا مصدقا لما معكم من قبل أن نطمس وجوها فنردها على أدبارها أو نلعنهم كما لعنا أصحاب السبت وكان أمر الله مفعولا إن الله لا يغفر أن يشرك به ويغفر ما دون ذلك لمن يشاء ومن يشرك بالله فقد افترى إثما عظيما ألم تر إلى الذين يزكون أنفسهم بل الله يزكي من يشاء ولا يظلمون فتيلا انظر كيف يفترون على الله الكذب وكفى به اثما مبينا الم تر الى الذين اوتوا نصيبا من الكتاب يؤمنون بالجبت والطاغوت ويقولون للذين كفروا هؤلاء اهدى من الذين امنوا سبيلا أولئك الذين لعنهم الله ومن يلعن الله فلن تجد له نصيرا أم لهم نصيب من الملك فإذا لا يؤتون الناس نقيرا أم يحسدون الناس على ما آتاهم الله من فضله فقد آتينا آل إبراهيم الكتاب والحكمة وآتيناهم ملكا عظيما فمنهم من آمن به ومنهم من صد عنه وكفى بجهنم سعيرا إن الذين كفروا بآياتنا سوف نصليهم نارا كلما نضجت جلودهم بدلناهم جلودا غيرها ليذوقوا العذاب إن الله كان عزيزا حكيما 
وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ سَنُدْخِلُهُمْ سَنُدْخِلُهُمْ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارُ لَهُمْ فِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارُ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا لَهُمْ فِيهَا أَزْوَاجٌ مُطَهَّرَةٌ وَنُدْخِلُهُمْ ظِلًّا ظَلِيلًا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أعوذ بالله سميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Here Allah سبحانه وتعالى He begins with before these ayat the ahkam of marriage يعني who you can marry who you cannot marry and there are a lot يعني in detail and then Allah سبحانه وتعالى says Allah wishes to make clear what is halal from what is haram يعني what is lawful from what is unlawful to you and to show you the ways of those before you and to accept your repentance and Allah is all knowing and all wise. Whatever is halal, Allah has made clear for us in the Quran and upon a lisan of the Mustafa alayhi salatu salam. Yani what is in the sunnah, the Quran and sunnah makes clear. Whatever is haram has also been made clear. And whatever has not been discussed, you leave it. Yani if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not discuss it, leave it. Don't ask questions about it. If you need to know, Ask the scholars who will give you the answer in the light of the Qur'an was sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to accept our tawbah. When we make mistakes, Allah loves to accept his tawbah. In the tafsir of this hadith, we see the Rasul, in the tafsir of this ayah, we see the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah told us that if people didn't make mistakes, then Allah will bring a new creation. To make mistakes, to sin and make tawbah and accept their tawbah. That's how forgiving Allah is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most forgiving, the most merciful. He loves to forgive His creation. Allah wishes to accept your repentance. But those who follow their lusts, their wishes, and that you believers should deviate from the way of the righteous path. What does that mean? Yani, insan makes mistakes. Insan falls into sin. That's a part of being human. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened that door of forgiveness for us. And alhamdulillah, imagine if there was no forgiveness, the first sin you did, that's it, you'd be in the hell forever. Allah can do that. But this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah opened that door. But there are people who want you to follow their lusts and desires, because that's what they want to follow. People want to go drink alcohol, people want to do zina, people want to do shirk, people want to do bid'at because it's fun for them. And they don't want to do it alone. That's why they say yani, the misery loves company. Yani, they're miserable in their sins and they want you to join. They want to drink alcohol, but they want you to drink alcohol. They're not happy just drinking their own. No, they want you to leave the right because when they see you following the truth, when they see Muslim women in niqab and hijab and abaya and this, they know that's the right thing to do, so they want to take that off. Yani before they told us that, oh, in Europe, for example, that niqab is not safe because when the face is covered, it's a security threat. So when a Muslim woman wanted to wear the niqab, they put fines on it, they outlawed it in many countries. Why? They said, oh, security. But now we see with the coronavirus, that everybody in those same countries is being ordered to wear the niqab, even men. It's no longer a security threat, what happened? Or when it has to do with the virus, then it's okay. But when it has to do with obedience to Allah, then it's not okay. This tells you the disease that those corrupt people have in their hearts. That same beard that they used to make fun of, once baseball players and basketball players and, and rappers started to have it, everybody wants a beard now. Why? Because if, if, if the fusak and fujar Wear it, then it's cool. But if you want to have it because you want to follow the order of Allah and the order of Rasulullah Sallallahu then it looks backwards. Then it looks unclean. Why? Because really it's, it's, it's that disease in the heart. It's not about the action. Before the adhan is a nuisance. Now because of coronavirus in so many countries across the world where the adhan was banned, now they're begging the Muslims go and give the adhan out loud. 
can watch the videos or look at the news articles on it. And Allah wishes to lighten the burden for you. And man was created weak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you khaffif. Yani Allah makes easy for us. I mean, there's a lot of tafsir here, but I'm going to keep it summarized. The sharia is to make life easy for us. The sharia makes life easy, makes things light, makes things... For example, you can't stand and pray, sit and pray. You can't sit and pray, lay down and pray. And in any which way, Allah makes it easy for you. You're traveling, you can't fast, it's okay, don't fast, come back and make it up. You're pregnant, you're breastfeeding, you're sick, you're going to get better, you're going to deliver that baby, your baby's going to no longer breastfeed. When you feel healthier, make up your fast. You're unable to ever fast. You have a chronic disease. Feed the needy. Look how practical the sharia is. And that lifestyle that Allah has ordained makes life easy. The haram makes life hard. And we don't, may not realize it. But ask those who have lost themselves and their desires that went from zina and clubbing and things to things that I don't want to even mention and still couldn't be satisfied until it killed them, destroyed their health, until they OD'd and until they... I mean, the filth that destroyed them, made life difficult for them. That's when you know Allah has made life easy for us with the sharia. وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانَ ضَعِيفَ An insan was created weak. And again, I'm not going to go deep here. But from the Bab of Tafsir, this is really referring to the weakness of men from controlling their desires. Insan yeah, he was created in weakness to begin with, but in, especially men. And this shows a virtue of women here. That women have better control over their desires than men. And this is a reality. Somebody could say, oh, why? Why are men like this? Why are women like this? Why? Uh, it's not our place to ask why. Allah created us the way He created us. He knows better. But we need to know the nature of insan and deal with it properly. Hijab honors a woman. It protects a society. Women in, in Western countries, and unfortunately now some of this filth is coming to the Muslim lands, that, that say we want to dress any which way we want and men should just control themselves. Well, that'd be great, but it's not reality. And, and in the West, in the Kuffar, we see the highest rates of rape and molestation and harm and things that happen and, and what happens at parties and what happens uh, yani at times with alcohol and indecent clothing and all these things mixed, it's a reality. You can say that it shouldn't be, but that, that's, what, what good is that? You can say that yani I should be able to walk down in bad neighborhoods and put money out and sit down and not be fearful even at 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., but that's not the reality we live in. Unless you have the laws of sharia, unless you have the hudud of what happens to the one who steals and thinks and that fear is put in the people, that's not reality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a sharia that deals with reality. Hijab protects a society. It protects women. It protects men from their evil that, that unfortunately tempts many a people. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that insan was created this way. So deal with the sharia to make everything easy for you. If Allah created insan one way, He also created a system of living that puts that in harmony. O you who believe, eat not of your properties amongst yourselves unjustly, except it be a trade amongst you. Be of mutual consent. And do not kill yourselves, nor, yani from the Bab of Tafsir, also meaning not to kill others. Surely Allah is merciful to you. The first thing to understand that we should not take of other people's money unjustly. And unfortunately, in the Muslim lands, we see this a lot. Yani people who have power and authority or, or a powerful tribe or this, or, or a per particular authority in a land, they will take somebody's property unjustly. And that's haram. And when you take from rishwa, yani from bribery and these things and feed your children, you feed your children haram. You put in their stomach the fire of hell. And then you expect them to come out to be like Al-Bukhari and Ahmad ibn Hanbal and these great A'imma? No. Those A'imma were who they were because their parents made sure they were fed halal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows trade. And He make trade when both of you agree on a trade. But don't be yani, uh, volume and oppressor in that trade. 
and don't kill yourselves. Yani, there is a lot of tafsir here again, and I'm, I'm summarizing where I'm afraid I'm not fulfilling the haq, but we ask Allah for forgiveness for the shortness of time. But one of the ahkam we derive from this is suicide is haram in Islam. Suicide is never permissible in Islam. Even if you're going through the worst hardships, suicide is to despair in the mercy of Allah. A Muslim can never be depressed. Even if you're going through hardship, you can be stressed. But never be depressed. Why? Always have hope in the mercy of Allah. If Allah has given you life, there is hope. And when there is no hope in life, Allah takes life naturally from you like death comes to you. Know that it will take away any distress that you had. The distress of this dunya is never everlasting. So never let yourself get frustrated or depressed up to a point of suicide. That is never the way of the Muslim. Always turn to Allah. In the Bab of Tafsir, there is a hadith, uh, يعني, the authentic hadith reported by uh, Thabit radiallahu anhu, Ibn al-Dahak, uh, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever intentionally swears falsely by religion other than Islam, then he is what he said. What does that mean? Yani, if somebody says, if this is not true, then I'll be a kafir. Some of the people, they make stupid statements like this. If, I'm, if it's like this, then I'm a Jew. If it's like this, then I'm a Christian. And if what he said isn't true, then he will, the hukam is upon them. Yani, may Allah protect us. And whoever commits suicide with a piece of iron will be punished with the same piece of iron in the hellfire. And if somebody shoots themselves, if somebody stabs themselves, somebody cuts themselves, then they will continually be punished with that in the hellfire. May Allah protect us all. And whoever commits that through aggression and injustice, we shall cast him into the fire. And that is easy for Allah. Whoever kills people, kills themselves, whoever does these kinds of dhulm, then Allah will throw them in the hellfire. And that's easy for Allah. Who will question Allah? There is no court, there is no, uh, there is no appeals. Allah is the master of everything. Allah is merciful. That's why Allah makes this way easy for us. But if you go against the laws of Allah, you have no power against Allah. If you avoid the great sins which you are forbidden to, we shall expiate your smaller sins and your minor sins and admit you into a noble entrance which is Al-Jannah. We sin day and night. Sometimes we sin not even realizing it. Looking at something and hearing something, you get in an elevator, you hear music, you, you open your, your cell phone to look at the news, you see pictures. We sin day and night, men and women. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful that if we stay away from the major sins, Allah has made ways to forgive our minor sins. What are those ways? From the Bab tafsir here, yes, one salah to the next salah, right? Umrah to the next Umrah, Hajj, yani. These things, walking to the masjid for salah, there's so many, so many that, that forgive your minor sins because those things will pile up. But it's upon us to make sure that we try our best to stay away from major and minor sins. Doesn't mean that minor sins are okay. But we have to do our best. But the major sins are destructive. I mean, they destroy a society, a community, and a person. If we look at major sins, Yani there are many, Imam al-Zahabi has written a book called Al-Kaba'ir. Yani you can read that, and there's a hadith of Ibn Abbas and so on. I'll mention one hadith just to and he give you an idea. And these are not all the major sins in one hadith, but I'll give you an idea. This hadith reported by Al-Bukhari uh, in volume number 8, hadith number 840, from Abu Hurairah, the Rasulullah sallallahu said, avoid the seven great destructive sins. Again, these are seven of the worst sins, but it doesn't mean there are, all, there are other major sins. What is the usul to know a major from minor sin? Any sin that has the la'na of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or a particular had from the hudud in sharia in dunya or in the akhirah is from the major sins. The Prophet sallallahu said, avoid the seven great destructive sins. They are, so the people, the sahaba radiyanam asked, oh Rasulullah, what are they? He said, to join partners with Allah. The first, the worst, the worst sin, shirk. Murder, robbery, nothing worse than shirk. Shirk is the greatest dhulm, it is the greatest oppression, it is the greatest sin, it is the greatest wrong. 
Allah gave you everything. Allah gave you life. Allah gave you wealth. Allah gave you health. Allah gave you your sight. Allah gave you everything. Allah blessed you with guidance. Allah opened up the ways of guidance for all of mankind. Opened up da'wah where anbiya came and books were sent and ba'at go out. And every, every insan has an opportunity to know about Islam and about the haqq. And with all of that and all the bounties of Allah, if you go and worship, you take the haqq of Allah and give it to a cow or a man or a prophet or a saint or a piece of wood, what is worse than that? Why is stealing wrong? Because the wealth is somebody else's and you take it, you take their haqq, right? Let's say a brother is driving in a car and somebody comes with a gun and takes his car by force, carjacks him. Why is that wrong? Because it wasn't yours, it was somebody else's haqq and you took it. Okay, but to, to be worshipped is the haqq of Allah. Imagine who steals from Allah that haqq. This is shirk. Second, to practice sorcery, magic, real magic. There's two types of magic. One, there's no white and black magic. This is like a western concept. There's no good magic. One is sleight of hand. Any things that are just show, like the magicians of Fir'aun, they were just deceiving people, right? And then there is the type of magic that Lance Armstrong and all these magicians and David Blaine, all these people that go, they're just tricks, and right? they're just trying to deceive people. That is also haram. I don't care if you're trying to uh, promote some Islamic video and you're doing tricks like that. No, those are also haram, as Ibn Qudam has mentioned in Mughni. And then there is real magic. And yes, there is real magic that can really harm people. May Allah protect us. And that is kufr. Real magic is kufr. When you do magic, when you, when you go to a person who writes you a taweez, yani an ambulance to get somebody to love you that doesn't love you, or get somebody to break up a household, you think that's from the sharia? No, this is magic. Even if they use the ayat of Quran, even if they use uh, yani the things that are related to the sharia in an incorrect manner, they use it for magic. And that is from Allah as well, as a test. Not to use poison is from Allah. Don't drink it. Yani, there's many things, poison oak is from Allah. Don't go and roll around in it. Everything has its place. Some things places, pork pig is from Allah. Don't eat it. That's not what it's meant for. Magic from Allah, it's a test. Don't fall for it. Third, to kill a person which Allah has forbidden. Yani somebody who's innocent. To kill an innocent person is a major sin. In Islam, we believe in preserving life. One of the maqasid of sharia is to preserve life. So terrorists and those people who go and take innocent life, this is haram in the sharia. In the sharia, life is protected. Except in things like capital punishment. Yani when somebody takes a life or in other things that are, that are ordained in the legal manner, yes, we believe in that. But innocent people can never be killed in the sharia. This is a major sin from the seven most destructive sins. Four, to flee from the enemy in the battlefield in the time of fighting. The Muslim is brave. The Muslim is, has to be strong. When you're in a, a battlefield, you never flee. You don't sit and curl up and cry like a girl. You have to stand and fight. And those who flee and leave the battlefield, this is a major sin. Now there is such a thing as a tactical retreat. And that, that's perfectly permissible. But to be a coward and leave the Muslims and run away and leave them in the battlefield is from the major sins. And to accuse, and to accuse the chaste women who have never been yani, in the way that, that the people have accused them of, then this is from the major sins. And to make a false accusation. And this, unfortunately, people take very lightly. But this is a major sin and can destroy people's lives. And wish not for the things in which Allah has made some of you to excel over others. For men, there is reward for what they have earned. And likewise, for women, they have a reward for what they have earned. And ask Allah for His bounty. Surely Allah is ever knowing and, uh, of everything. Subhanallah. Never be jealous of others. If Allah gave you something, that is best for you. Never, and this, this I mean, the Bible tafsir here is for those 
who try to be in the place of another gender or another people. Like somebody may say, why did Allah, like a woman may say, why did Allah not make me a man? I wish I was a man. Right? Or some man may say, why did Allah not make me a woman? I want to be a woman. I want to choose my gender. No. If Allah made you a man, then that's what you should be. That's what you were meant to be. Thank Allah for it. If Allah made you a woman, then that's what you were meant to be. Thank Allah for it. That's it. If you don't know your gender, it's an easy test. <laughs> Go to the bathroom, see how you do it, you'll figure it out. Right? And that gender is your gender. Yani there are issues of khunta and things like that the Sharia discusses, but in, 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 in general, you have to be happy where you are. They say the grass is always greener on the other side. And the women talk about, oh, men have it easy. Men talk about, oh, women have it easy. Everybody has it hard in their own way and everybody has it easy in their own way. So be thankful where you are. Don't say, oh, I wish I was Arab. I wish I was Ajam. I wish I was Chinese. I wish I was white. I wish I was black. I wish I was brown. No. If you're white, Allah bless you with being white. Thank Allah for it. If you're black, Allah bless you with being black. Thank Allah for it. If you're brown, thank Allah for it. Allah bless you with being brown. If you're whatever nationality, whatever, this is what was best for you. And know that there is no preference of genders, of colors, of races, except in taqwa. One pious woman is better than a thousand fasik fajr men. One pious man is better than a thousand fasik fajr women. One pious ajam is better than a, fas- than a thousand fasik fajr arab. Or one pious arab is better than a thousand fasik fajr ajam. It doesn't matter. Be pious, ask Allah for his bounty, and be happy with what Allah has given you. And to everyone, and also, and I want to make a point here, Allah clarifies that for men is a reward for what they do, and for women is a reward for what they do. Nobody's good deeds are wasted. So everybody needs to strive to be the best in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to everyone, we have appointed their heirs for property, I mean those that will inherit from them, and that is left from their parents and relatives, and those also to whom we have made a pledge of brotherhood, give them their due portion in their wasiha. Truly Allah is ever witness over all things. And there's a lot of tafsir here again, but in summary, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained mirah. How is the property divided up when somebody dies? The sharia has ordained it and that is the best way. Follow that way. You cannot make up your own way. You cannot think, I think a son should get this much and a cousin should get this much and a daughter get this. No. Allah knows better. Follow the sharia for it. Men are the protectors and maintainers of women because Allah has made them to excel over the other and because of what they spend from their means. Therefore, the righteous women are devout and obedient to Allah and to their husbands and guard of their husbands, uh, yani what is in their absence of what Allah has ordered them to, be, to guard from chastity and property. Tayyib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells, Rijal qawamun ala nisa. Yani men are the caretakers over women. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set it up. And we as Muslims, men and women, have to accept this. For the Muslim man, you have to be the, the, out there active, taking care of your family, earning a living, protecting them. You can't be weak. Many Muslim men, they're a disgrace to Muslim men today. Wallahi, the, the women of Sahaba were better than them. Many Muslim women, they don't want to, men, they don't want to go work. They want to sit around, watch TV. They want to sit around, play video games, not working. And that's not a man. You're a man, you have to go, you have to strive, you have to struggle, you have to go through hardships, you have to do all of that, but you have to provide for your family. Many men nowadays, uh, because they don't have any ghira, they, they send their women out, and those women sometimes get harmed. I and mean, we know cases, they come to us in the masjid, in, in very bad ways, in Me Too movement types of ways, but the man is too lazy to work. And he knows his woman is in that situation, he still forces her. And those women come and they come to the masjid, they tell us, they cry. Said, my man, yani my husband is like this. And this is wrong in the Sharia. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained some things on men to go out, to be protectors, to be guardians, to be strong, to make sure the women are protected and honored. And this is not to abuse, but rather to be loving and protective. 
And our Muslim sisters need to understand that they have their own status in Islam. And they have their own place in Islam. But the man is meant to lead. This is the natural order of things. This is the fitra of insan. The man is the head of that household. This is reality. And when you, when you, when you mess with that reality, then you see the broken households, then you see a divorce rate more than 50%, then you see children and, and their tarbiyah having gone because their, their mothers are out and their dads left and now their, their caretakers a, a TV and a, 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 a daycare and things like this. And then you wonder why we have all these school shootings and why we have such high suicide rates and why we have all these kinds of uh, things going on in society. Well, you messed up the natural order. But Allah has ordained that national order. And, and a pious woman is the one that obeys Allah. And in, in obeying Allah, obeys her husband. In what is right. If your husband orders you to haram, there is no obedience in haram. But if he obeys you something that is halal, mubah, and mustahab, and fard, and all of that is obedience there. As the men, men are loving and, and, and caring and, and, and worried about the tarbiyah and, and about the protection and about bringing the risk for the woman, the woman has to play her role as well and be that nurturing force in the household and be that, 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 that person who protects the, the sanctity of herself and the household even when the husband is not there. As the husband protects his own uh, yani sight and his own uh, yani character outside, the woman protects that in the house. As of those women to whom part you see ill conduct, conduct admonish them. And next, refuse to share their bed. And lastly, hit them as lightly to be a, a reminder. But if they turn to obedience, seek not against them a means of annoyance. Surely Allah is ever the most high and most great. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets a tartib or a method of how to deal with issues in the house. If you see a woman that is yani, going past the boundaries of chastity, of, of proper conduct, then it is upon the husband as the one who does tarbiyah to first and foremost teach her. And may Allah protect us all and guide us all and give us all the ability to control for our men, to control our tempers. Many men, especially in the West, especially in the West, they are quick to hit and fight and abuse and, and, and get drunk and come home and just be abusive. And the Sharia protects the women against that. What is the first thing? Is to talk to her, is to tell her, is to stop her, is to verbally give her encouragement to leave that immoral or illicit act. And if not, then to separate your beds from them. And to give a physical separation, to give as a, a clear warning that, that what is to come if you don't stop this action of being divorced, it's much worse. So before all that, to separate the beds. And if after that you have to, then physically stop them. I and mean, physically, sometimes you have to. And this again is never in the way of abuse. This again is never in the way of what we see in the West and what we see in the East in some of the countries where people leave marks and they hit and they abuse. That abuse is haram in Sharia. As the Rasulullah said about using the miswak as a chastisement. Or more than that at some times. This is, this is there as a father, as a guardian, as a husband. You have to make sure about the tarbiyah in your household. But Allah is saying that if the woman leaves that sin or that child or that household, leaves that illicit act, then don't keep holding it over their head. Don't keep looking for ways to divorce. Don't keep looking to cause problems. Rather, bring harmony in the household. And surely Allah is ever most high and most great. And if you fear a breach between them, and if you, if you fear that the husband and wife are going to divorce, then appoint two people from each of the families, from uh, yani her family and his family, to sit down. And both of them to wish peace and tranquility and to bring uh, reconciliation between them. And indeed Allah is all-knowing and well-acquainted of all things. What does that tell us? That if the issue is not solved, then you should bring somebody, a good person, who wants to make that marriage work from his family and her family and sit down and try to reconcile. Or you can go to scholars and have them and take the issue to them or to an Islamic judge. There is many ways, but this is one of the ways, which is to bring two people from each side. 
And this works in society as well, as we saw what happened between Ali radiyanhu and Muawiyah radiyanhu and Ibn Mas'ud radiyanhu and Amr ibn As came to reconcile between the ummah. And this is to be done in a household to reconcile. But always we try to save ourselves from divorce and talaq and these things. We try to always, it is halal. I mean, there is a place for it. We're not Catholics, we're not Hindus. We don't, we don't say there is no place for it. But we try to always reconcile between the two to have that loving household for children to be raised with their own fathers and their own mothers. Worship Allah and join none with Him in worship and do, not, and, and do good to your parents and kinfolk, kinfolk and orphans and masakeen, the poor and the neighbor who is near of kin and the neighbor who is a stranger and the companion by your side and the wayfarer, yani the one who is a traveler that you meet and those who are slaves and those that your right hand possesses. Be good to all of them. Verily, Allah does not like such that are proud and boastful. SubhanAllah. What does Allah subhanahu wa tell us? First thing, don't make shirk. Shirk is the worst sin. And what is the second most any serious thing that Allah enjoins here? Being obedient to your parents. Being good to your parents. Allah says, do not worship anybody other than Allah. Don't make shirk and do good to your parents. And then after your parents, then your family, your brothers, your sisters, your, your kinfolk, your, those that are related to you, and to orphans, yani people that are yatam, yani the, the yatim, the one who doesn't have a parent or a mother, uh, or a father or a mother, those you have to be kind to them. And masakeen, who are poor. When you see somebody poor, don't just look down on them, oh, you're broke, you smell bad, you this, you that. No, try to help. And imagine if you were in that situation. This is why you thank Allah for the bounties and, and that Allah has given you and try to help those that are less fortunate than you. And your neighbor, who is your relative and the one that's a stranger. A Muslim is always good to their neighbors. Muslim neighbors, non-Muslim neighbors, relatives, non-relatives. A Muslim has to be good to their neighbors. And to your companion. And many, and the sahib here has many meanings in tafsir. But yani, one of them being to your spouse, but then that would be covered earlier as well. Also to your friends and to those that are close to you, to be good and kind to them. And to those that you meet, whether they are travelers, whether somebody is a slave, whether somebody is a servant, whether somebody works for you, whether somebody is an employee employed by you, to be good to them. And this is the orders of Allah. And Allah does not love does not like, is not happy with those that are proud and boastful, those that look down on others, those that brag, those that, 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 that demean and put down others, whether it's verbally or whether it's physically, whether it's in their heart, whether it's through their comments. Those who are miserly and enjoy miserliness and, and other men that hide that Allah has bestowed upon them of His bounties, and we have prepared for the disbelievers a disgraceful torment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love those that, are, that have bukhal. Yani they are stingy. Those that are close-fisted. No, Allah loves those that give for the sake of Allah. And Allah blesses them. And those that tell others to be bakhil. No, no, don't give for the sake of Allah. Don't give that poor person. No, those people, they don't need it. Allah does not love that quality. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about those people that hide the bounties of Allah. Some people, they're very rich, but they're always worried about hiding everything. No, I don't want anybody to know. I don't want anybody to ask me then. Because if they know that I have money, then maybe they'll ask me, oh, bukhul, bukhul, bukhul. And then they die, and they never use any of that. And it gets left, and then their children waste it. And Allah says He's prepared a, a harsh punishment for the kuffar, for the kafirin. And, he, and this tells you that these qualities are qualities of kuffar. Even if some Muslims have them, may Allah take them out from us. And also those who spend of their sustenance to be seen of men. Allah doesn't love those who spend just for show. And believe not in Allah in the last day. And they don't think they will get the reward from Allah. They're just doing it. Oh, if I do give money, at least I'll get a tax, tax, tax credit from it. Or if I give sadaqah, at least people will think I'm, I'm generous. And then, oh, I give this much. Oh, I give these many people. Oh, I do this, I do that, I built this. No. Leave it for Allah. Allah sees it. And those that, yani, from the Bible of Tafsir, that they are the friends of shaitan. 
Because then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever takes shaitan as an intimate yani friend and a dreadful friend he is, or intimate. And whoever takes shaitan as a friend, the worst friend he is. Shaitan will destroy you. And we, all of us, may Allah protect us at some level, listen to shaitan. And that's why Uthman ibn Affan and some of the Salaf and some of the Sahaba, they used to say, Ajabtu, like I'm amazed at the amr of the person who knows shaitan to be an enemy and still listens to him. Shaitan is your clear enemy. Anything shaitan tells you from laziness, from immorality, from not praying or not fasting or, or, or whatever else, all of that is bad for you. Trust me, everything shaitan tells you is bad. So why do we still follow him? I and mean, this is something that will lead us to a, a horrible end if we don't control that. And what loss have they, have they if they had believed in Allah in the last day and they had spent out of what Allah had given them from sustenance and Allah is all knowing over them. Imagine, what would you lose if somebody believes in the Akhirah, somebody believes in Allah, somebody spends from what Allah has given you, what are you going to lose? Nothing. Allah will increase that barakah. Those who are Muslim lose nothing in dunya. We live a cleaner life. We live a better life. We have statistically, we have less divorce. We have less family issues. We have less cases of rape and molestation and all these things in the Muslim lands. We have less crime rates yani, as far as theft and things like this. At least those lands that implement the Sharia. And Muslims who live by the Sharia that don't drink alcohol, alhamdulillah, Think about all the things from drunk driving and accidents and murders and drunk fights and, 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 and overdose of drugs and all those things that we're safe from because we follow the Sharia. What did we lose? We only gained. Those that fast get all the benefit of a better immune system and cleansing of the body and all of that and we get the Akhirah. People fast, dry fasting, kuffar, just for the health benefits. Alhamdulillah, we get those and we get the Akhirah. So as a Muslim, what do you lose? You don't lose anything. Even in dunya you have a better life, in the akhirah you have a better life. Surely Allah wrongs not even of the weight of an atom or a small ant. Dharra, a dharra in Arabic is the lightest thing you can think of. I don't know, like atom used to be. I think nucleus is smaller than atom, right? Popular science. No? What's the smallest thing we know? Huh? Uh, what? A cork? Quark. Part of an atom called quark. Lightest thing. Dharra in Arabi, in Arabi is the lightest thing that language can refer to. So if you think of the lightest, smallest thing that you know, whether it's an atom or a nucleus or a quark or whatever else, then know that Allah does not wrong even the weight of that. But if there is any good done, yani, there, it will it will never be lost. And if anything good is done, Allah will keep it. And Allah will never wrong you in any way. He, anything good that's done, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doubles it and multiplies it and gives him in great reward. And there are a hadith that mention 70 times and 700 times and more than that. What does it mean? That Allah loves to be merciful. Any good you do, Allah multiplies. But Allah never wrongs you. Who will it be then when we bring forth each nation a witness and we bring you Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi as a witness against these people on the day that those who believed and disobeyed the messenger, who, those who disbelieved and disobeyed the messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will wish that they were buried in the earth but they will never be able to hide a single fact from Allah. This nation is a witness on the other nations. We talked about that uh, I believe yesterday or earlier. So I will not go over that again. But on the Day of Judgment, we will be a witness because we are the last nations. We know about their akhbar, about their news from the Quran and the Torah and the Injil and history and so on. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that on, on that Day of Judgment, those who disbelieved and disobeyed the Prophet there's two things. One, to just make kufr. But many of the people in our ummah, they, they say oh, we believe. But then they deny the sunnah, they deny the hadith, they disobey the Prophet About them that Allah subhanahu wa says that that day they will wish they were buried in the earth. They will wish that they were just in that grave. They will wish they were never raised. They will wish in other ayat we will find that they will wish that they were dust and they were dirt. And they will wish that they never existed and all these things. But it's too late. 
That's why you always have to keep the Akhirah in front of you. Because the Day of Judgment, there is no undo button. You can't just be like, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not feeling this, I'm out. No. <laughs> You're there. And you have, there's no death. There's no exit. You can't ex, ex the window out. So that day they will wish they were buried in earth, but Allah, but Allah said they will never be able to hide a single fact from Allah. Right now you can hide. You can say, did you pray? Yeah, I prayed. Maybe you didn't pray. You can say, did you give zakat? Yeah, I paid zakat. Maybe you didn't pay zakat. You can say, that true? You can lie. You can go to court and lie and get away with it. You can kill somebody and get away with it. So many cases in America. And you get a good lawyer, Johnny Cochran. So you can get away with it in dunya. But in the Akhirah, you cannot hide anything from Allah. Your own skin will bear witness, as we'll find in the Qur'an. Your own eyes, your own lip, your own tongue. Nothing will be hidden from Allah. O you who believe, approach not a salah when you are in a state of drunk, being drunk, until you know the meanings of what you utter. Nor when you are in a state of janaba, yani a state of being junub, a state of uh, impurity, in what we know to be hadath al-akbar, except when uh, traveling on a road or just passing through yani, uh, without water until you wash your whole body. Tayyib, so the first issue gets to be khamar, alcohol was made haram in three stages in the Quran. This is one of them, uh, not the final one. And which is the first was that you shouldn't come close to salah when you're drunk. Then there is harms in it and there is good in it. But the harms outweigh the good. And then the stage of totally stay away from alcohol. Okay? So there are stages. And the hukam of when you're in state of janaba, whether it is through uh, what's called a wet dream, or it's through jama'a, or any other ways that you can be in a state of being junub. And this is not a fiqh dars here. Uh, we have fiqh dudus people can follow to learn all the ahkam there. You cannot make salah in that until you make ghusl. Unless you're traveling, and then we'll talk about the issue. Or if you're not traveling, but there is no water, you can make tayammum. And we'll talk about tayammum coming up in this ayah, inshallah. Um, also from the Bab al-Tafsir, uh, if, you, if you are in a state of janaba or haid, and you're just going through a masjid, like you just want to go through, you can sit in the masjid, but you can go through. Uh, until you have made ghusl, and if you are ill or on a journey or one of you comes after answering the call of nature, now we're talking about not just being junab, but also breaking the wudu or being in hadat al-azghar as it's called. Or you have been in contact with women and this again goes back to jama'ah. Or you find no water, then perform tayammam. Yani if you, for wudu or ghusl, hadat al-azghar or akbar, either way you can perform tayammam in its place. And with clean earth, Yani, uh, what is from the earth and rub there in your faces and your hands. And tayammum can be made in two ways. One is to dust and just do the hands and then face or face and hand depending on what you're doing it for. Again, if you watch this, the fiqh durus of Aqsar al-Mukhtasarat or al-Umda or Zaad as we're doing, you will get those ahkam clearly there. Truly Allah is of forgiving and most pardoning. Have you not seen those who were given a portion of the book, yani the Yahud that were given scriptures? Purchasing the wrong path and wish that you should go astray from the right path. Subhanallah, and you will see this a lot for the Yahud. That they will always try to trick. And not only will they try to trick Allah, but they will trick themselves and trick others and try to misguide others. And Allah has full knowledge of your enemies. And Allah is sufficient a wali. And Allah is sufficient a, a uh, a nasir or a helper Allah is enough for you and Allah knows their plot don't worry about the masons and the illuminati and, and this conspiracy and that conspiracy okay all that is going on whatever what are you doing? are you making salah? are you learning your knowledge? are you learning your Quran? are you learning your fiqh? are you implementing that in your household uh, on a grassroots level? what da'wah are you doing? are you involved in your masjid? are you involved in the community? if you're not doing anything sitting around and talking about the enemies are doing is of no help but if you're on it, if you're following the Sharia, if you're coming together as an Ummah, if you're obedient to Qur'an and Sunnah, then know that when Allah helps you, He's sufficient for you. Amongst those who are Jews, the Yahud, there are some who, who displace the words from their right 
places to say that we hear the words of Muhammad Sallallahu and we obey. And we hear and let you يعني, hear nothing. And so here, Ra'ina, which is mentioned here in this ayah, Ra'ina has a meaning. And what the Yahud would do is they would try to twist words. In the Bab of Tafsir also, when they would say, Sam alaykum, yani, may death or poison be on you. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he was never harsh against them. He would just say, wa alaykum. Aisha radiyallahu anha, radiyallahu anha, one day she got upset and she said, wa alaykum, wa la'natullah, wa yani, ghadabihi, ya ikhwan al-aqrad, qard wa al-khanazir. And she went off. She said, you know, upon you be the dirt curse and, and, and of Allah and, and his wrath and his punishment O oh, uh, brothers or, or, or people of, of uh, brothers of monkeys and, and pigs because what uh, Yahud had been punished in the past she got upset because they were trying to curse the Prophet by changing the words but the Prophet told, him, told her that alayki, alayki upon you is not to be harsh and he just say wa alaykum don't be harsh but the Yehud always tried this and they would tell the Prophet some things like we hear you yani, even though, and they would try to change the words and the word here Ra'ina in Arabic had the meaning of people who listen to each other but in their language in Hebrew it was an insult so they would try to change the word to insult the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but they weren't brave enough to do it to his face clearly so they would do it and people today too hee hee, they, they, they whisper something against you like you're driving and they're like hey you terrorist or whatever they're not man enough or woman enough or brave enough to come and say it to your face or they try to change words or use insults this is a, 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 a despicable way of acting and this is why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala curses them and they twist their tongues as a mockery of the religion of Islam. And if only they had said, we hear and obey, and do, do make us understand. And if only they had said, we hear the Quran and the Sunnah, we hear and obey, and try to really understand, it would have been better for them and more proper. But Allah has cursed them for their disbelief, so they, so they believe not except a few. Oh, you have been given the scripture, yani the Yahud and Nasara, the Christians and Jews, believe in what we have revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu yani in the Quran, confirming what is already w- with you before we face the faces by making yani, a, a curse or disfigurement upon them and turn them hidewards and curse them as we curse the Sabbath breakers and the commandment of Allah is always fulfilled or executed. There's a lot of tafsir here I'm going to summarize. There were those from the Yahud that used to try to trick Allah, as there are today, from the Yahud and sometimes from the Muslims, unfortunately. They were told not to fish on Saturday. So what did they do? They put their nets in on Friday and took them out on Sunday. The Shara is here in the Ayah of Quran and the Tafsil is there in the Sahih Ahadith. So what did they say? We're not fishing on Saturday. We put our nets in on Friday, we take them out. Just like we do today with riba, the Muslim ummah. It's not riba, it's profit. Well, it's not a bribe, it's a gift. <laughs> Give me this much of a gift and I'll take care of this. You think you can trick Allah? Never. Allah sees everything. Allah knows everything. Allah knows what's in your heart. Allah knows your intentions. So these people, they did this and they became three people. One, those who did the fishing themselves. Second, those who didn't do the fishing themselves, but they warned the people once, and then when the people didn't listen, they, they continued their relationships with them. And the third, those that didn't do it themselves, and continued to boycott and stop and warn those who did do it. And there's a lot of tafsir here and aqwal of ulama, what is the essence of it, that only those who themselves didn't do the haram, and continued to do the amr bin ma'roof and nahal munkar, to continue to call towards right and forbid from evil, they were saved. And those who did this action, they were turned into monkeys and pigs. As Ibn Kathir mentions from Sahih Rawayat, they died out in a year. It's not like you see a monkey today, oh, you're the children of those Yahud, they used to do that, or a pig today. No, they died out. Within about a year, they died out. But it was a, a disgrace and punishment on them. And Allah is telling us today that be careful before Allah puts a punishment like that on us. Verily Allah forgives not that partner should be set up with him in worship, but he forgives except that anything else to whom, the one sin 
that Allah has made on Himself. Allah can do anything, but Allah has made this rule on Himself that if you die and you go to Allah with shirk, Allah will not forgive it. Other than that, any sin can be forgiven. Shirk, Allah does not forgive. The worst sin is shirk. To whom, and to whom he wills, whoever sets up partners with Allah in worship, he has indeed invented a tremendous sin. He has, yani when you set up, when you go and worship a grave, what can that grave really do? What can that monkey really do? People worship, I was in India, people worship rats. Why you worship a rat? You think rat gives you, give you life? You think a rat gave you your, 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 your uh, aqal and your body and all the benefits you have? And you think a rat gave it to you? No. So why would you worship a rat? Why would you worship a cow? Why would you worship Buddha? Why would you worship Jesus? Peace be upon him. Why would you worship the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Some people did today in our ummah they worship the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They make dua to him, not just wasila but dua to him. Have you not seen those from the Yahud and Nasara, from the Christians and Jews, who claim sanctity for themselves? Nay, but Allah sanctifies them whom He wills. He sanctifies whom he wills and they will not be dealt with in, in injustice even equal to the extent of a scalish thread in the long slit of a date stone. Some people, like the Christians today, they come out, they're like, I'm saved. Are you saved? I'm already saved. Salvation is free. I'm saved. How do you know? You don't have a guarantee. Where's the guarantee? In that corrupted text that you call a Bible today? No, there's no guarantee. Allah will judge. But Allah will not wrong anybody look how they invent a lie against Allah and enough is that as a manifest sin those who change the Bible those who say Jesus said what he didn't say these are lies against Allah have you not seen those who were given a portion of the scripture they believe in Jipt and Taghut Jipt and Taghut and I don't, I don't want to go deep in Tafsir but as we mentioned about Taghut is Anything that is worshipped except Allah can fall under Jipt and Taghut. Not just worship like making sujood and things, but somebody who says that communism is better than Islam is, is, is following the Jipt and Taghut. Why? Because Allah is Ahsan al Hakimin. Allah is the best Ahsan Ahkam for those who give a Sharia. So if you believe in a sharia other than that of Allah, if you think that's better, then you're, then you're, then you're following the taghut and jibt. And say to the disbelievers that they are better guided as regards to the way than the believers. Those people who say, oh, Christians are better than us because they're better neighbors. Jews are better than us because they're better at finance and lobbying. Oh, oh Buddhists are better than us because of this, better than that. No, the Muslims, alhamdulillah, are the best. And if we have mistakes, we need to correct our mistakes. But we never praise a nation above ourselves. We ask Allah to guide us and make us as guidance for them. They are those whom Allah has cursed. Those kuffar are cursed. Don't praise them. And he whom Allah curses, you will not find for, the, for him any helper. Or have they a share in the dominion? Then it is that they cause the word that they would not give mankind even a speck of the back of a date stone. Can we stop? 57, right? If Allah gave those kuffar control over the, the universe or, or the dominion or the mulk, they wouldn't even give each other, they wouldn't give mankind anything. They're so greedy. They have that greed. But it's because of them not having absolute power as Allah has that they deal in somewhat yani, a moderate manner. Allah has absolute power, but look how merciful Allah is. Or do they envy men, yani regarding who is meant by men, a Nasir, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and the Sahaba, and, and those who followed them from his Ummah, from the Muslims. For what Allah has given them, the Kuffar, they envy the Muslims from his bounties. Then we have already given to the family of Ibrahim the book and Hikmah. The book, yani from Al Ibrahim came the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he was given the Quran. And the Hikmah, which is the Sunnah. The sunnah that was given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and conferred upon them a great kingdom. Allah blessed this ummah. Of them were some who believed in him, yani the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and of them were some who averted their faces from him, yani from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and enough of a hell of 
enough is the hell for burning them. And from the Sahaba were the people who followed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Those are the Sahaba, those are the, the Quraysh, the Arab, the Ansar, the, the Ajam, whoever was in that time. But from the Quraysh, from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi were those who diverted their faces, who made kufr and hell is enough to burn them. Surely those who disbelieve in our ayat, in our proofs, we shall burn them in the fire. As often as their skins are roasted through, we shall change them for other skins and that they may taste the punishment. Truly Allah is ever most powerful and all wise. The fire of hell is something you cannot imagine. It is much worse than the fire you can imagine in dunya. It's not like any punishment. In dunya, something burns you, you get better, you heal. In Jahannam, the, the punishment continues. May Allah protect us all. Don't take chances with Jahannam. Don't take chances with Jahannam. Don't think about going to Jahannam for a day or a minute. Protect ourselves. We need to protect ourselves from even seeing Jahannam. May Allah protect us. But those who believe in the oneness of Allah, in Tawheed, and do, the right, do righteous deeds, we shall admit them into the gardens, the Jannah, under which rivers flow, a paradise abiding therein forever. There shall be the, yani, the purified mates, spouses there, and we shall admit them into shades, wide and ever-deepening paradise. Al-Jannah is so beautiful. It cannot be explained. These are just examples. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go deep here, but every, every wish, every good thing you could desire, you would have in Jannah. Such bliss you can't imagine. This is something as if you were explaining this life to the child in a womb. If you went to a child who had not lived this life and was in the womb, how would you explain cars? How would you explain trees? How would you explain birds? The child has never seen anything like that. So you would try to give little examples the child knows inside the womb. You would see, you see that little speck, a tree is kind of like that. You see this little uh, yani thing passing you by inside the womb from fluids. Well, water is kind of like that. But in reality, this world is so much better, so much bigger, so much greater than anything they could imagine. That's how Jannah is. Don't worry about, oh, what am I going to do this in Jannah? How am I going to do this? Just know this. If you get to Jannah, you will be happy as, as happy can be. More than you can imagine in this dunya. And if you go to Jahannam, it will be a worse punishment than anything you can imagine in this dunya. And this is why Allah gives us these examples. May Allah give us the ability to practice on what we have heard. Jazakumullahu khairan.